welcome to episode 13 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. Unlucky for some, eh? <laughs> well, that was Tony. I'm Simon. And I am Davey. And I'm Laura. What's coming up in the show today? We've got an interview with Billy Cena from Canonical Training. We've got an interview with Andy Stanford clark one of our listeners, who um, talks about how we can use the transcripts that we were talking about in episode 10 to produce British Sign Language versions of the podcast. Oh, interesting stuff. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. We've got the news. We're going to talk about um, virtual private servers. We'll give you the results of uh, the last episode's competition for the Canonical Store Voucher. And then we've got a competition to give away £200 worth of Bitvoke VPS. And we have a discussion about trademarks and Canonical's enforcement of them. Well, to me, that sounds like a fun-packed show. We're here with Billy Cena from Canonical. Billy, what is it you do? Uh, Well, I look after the training programme, basically, for all of the Ubuntu-related activities. Um, so any, any time anybody's interested in any kind of training, they basically look in my direction and hopefully I have the right kind of answer for them. So what sort of training things do Canonical offer at the moment? So since we kicked off the programme, which was, oh, it's coming up for two years now, how time flies when we're having fun, <laughs> uh, we've basically developed quite a few courses. I think most people will be familiar with the Ubuntu Certified Professional, which is the first certification that came out. And, uh, we sort of like um, hatched the chicken before we laid any eggs. Um, because there was a certification, but there wasn't any way or any means for people to actually train for it. There were no courses. So we had the Ubuntu 199 exam, which I'm not sure if some people are familiar, but it's attached to the LPI Level 1 certification. So basically, anybody who is LPI certified, they can then sit the Ubuntu 199 exam, and they become an Ubuntu certified professional. All well and good. Mm -hmm. No training courses were in place. Um, So basically my first task at hand was to create courses so that people could actually study for these exams uh, or prepare for these exams. Um, And that we have, yeah, that we launched well over a year ago. Okay. Uh, Can you just explain, what's the difference between the LPI and the Ubuntu-specific one? I mean, there must be some sort of overlap there. Yeah, so LPI basically promotes the knowledge of Linux, all kinds of Linux. So people, you know, learn about, you know, both Red Hat and SUSE and they touch on sort of like Debian. Uh, but it, but the overlap with Ubuntu is obviously in the Ubuntu 199 for the Ubuntu 199 exam. It's Ubuntu specific, which is why on top of the LPIC1 certification, which covers very generalistic subjects, the Ubuntu 199 exam is purely dedicated to what people know about Ubuntu stroke, a little bit of Debian as well, obviously. Was there a reason for going and adding your own examination to the, an existing qualification rather than setting up your own certification program in the same way Red Hat have got one, for example? Yeah, well, initially, um, first of all, we wanted to support the Linux Professional Institute. We think that, you know, it's a very important, um, to promote Linux in general is sort of like hugely important for, for the whole um, Linux community as, as a whole. So that was, you know, bonus number one. Secondly, um, to get into the whole certification market until you have the numbers at hand, um, you really need a body that's backing you. Um, Red Hat has the advantage of having got in, being in there first, um, which is over 10 years ago when they started their certifications. Um, and so they went down their own route, which you know, is a very credible certification. SUSE also started out with LPI and then they split off. Um, and Ubuntu, likewise, we just, A, wanted to really back LPI, and secondly, we, see, we saw a huge advantage with, with um, adding the Ubuntu certification onto a certification that's already accredited out there in the market, as opposed to starting everything from scratch. Has it had a lot of interest, the Ubuntu certification? Absolutely. Um, we get, well, there's, we're, we're now almost three bodies in the, in the training team. Um, we do get a lot of requests all the time, um, and we have something like close to 150 Ubuntu certified professionals. So in a year, I'd say that's not bad going. Um, and we do get, you know, people are on the courses all the time. Uh, we now have an online version as well as an instructor nerd version, and there are people signing up constantly. Is it more of a desktop qualification than a server-based it's, one then? Absolutely, yes, it is a desktop qualification. Is there any um, plans for sort of a lower level training, almost sort of user level training? So there is desktop course, uh, which again has been uh, hugely popular. It was created uh, with the Ubuntu community. We started off the project with community involvement and we went all the way through development to completion with community involvement. And it's two days of instructor-led training, um, which covers 10 different modules. 
And the whole idea is that if people want to learn just about open office and internet and email configuration, they can do that. If they also want to go into multimedia applications or if they want to go into um, video applications, they can do that as well, whatever, whatever they want to do. And it's freely downloadable from the web. So it's um, because it was produced by the community, it's there for community use and it's there for, for, for them to spread the word and uh, help other users get involved as well. Sounds good. The instructor-led classroom sessions, where, where are you actually running them? I mean, are you running them in every country? Or? Um, so right now we've got training partners in 10 countries, and um, the latest partner, QAIQ, is the, um, the, partner, the partner that we take signed on board uh, for the UK. And um, what we do is in each market that we've seen a large demand for Ubuntu or where we'd like to create a large demand for Ubuntu installations and deployments, uh, we basically set up training partners and don't really give them exclusivity, but we, we do help them along the way, and we don't put too much competition in their way, if you, if you see what I mean. So <laughs> QRQ right now are the only ones in the U.K. They've got over 21 locations throughout the U.K., and um, I'm sure they're going to do a really, really grand job. Um, they've got many of the, um, the big-name courses on their portfolio, and the reason why we took them on board is because we saw a great overlap between the courses that they're currently offering and the demand that they're having for Ubuntu, which was uh, quite interesting. So if you um, want to do just the exam, say, do you, where can you go to do that? Is that the same centres or are there extra ones for just doing the assessment? You don't have to sit the exam. Uh, you don't have to take the course at all. You can just sit for, for the exam at any uh, view of Prometric testing centre, and the cost is $100 or 50 quid in the UK. That's not too bad. Um, the, Q, yeah. the QAIQ residential course, or the five-day course or whatever, is a bit more than that. It's about £1,500, I think. Um, presumably this is aimed more at businesses who want to get their staff trained in Ubuntu than you know, the individual desktop user at home. That's right, yeah. So the system administrator basically who um, in a couple of weeks' time or a month's time is going to have to deploy Ubuntu in the office um, is going to sit through that course. And it's two courses, essentially, two courses, five days each. So you have sort of 80 hours. Uh, the £1,500 is for 40 hours, so for right. one course and then you have another one. But I believe that QRQ are offering Ubuntu community members uh, a quite a nice discount um, if they if they go and do that course. Oh right. Course. Oh, we like yeah. we like discounts. <laughs> yeah, we like discounts. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think I think it's ten percent. Um, and anybody who's interested in that should literally just send an email to training at ubuntu dot com, and we will take care of the rest. That ten percent is not to be sniffed at. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So where do you see training developing from uh, Canonical in the future? A lot of our courses at the moment is based on partner enablement. Partners sign a, a, a contract with us, for example, Dell, um, and that's all very well and good, but somebody's got to actually teach them what to do with Ubuntu once, they've, once the deal has been done. So a lot of our focus is on partner enablement right now, uh, teaching partners how to install Ubuntu, how to customize it, how to make the most out of it. I mean, if you look at Ubuntu today, um, a lot of what we're doing um, and what we're trying to get across is, is similar to web applications from 15 years ago. Um, and it's all about teaching people and enabling people to do something with open source and with Linux specifically. Um, and that's very much what we're focused on. We're, make, we're really focusing on making life easier for the people who are currently not using open source software and applications and not using Linux to get involved um, at, you know, and literally at any level. And that's what it's all about. We've created an online desktop course as well, which is literally a hand-holding course for mum and dad or all the office worker who are, you know, were interested in getting involved, interested in, in moving away from proprietary software and making it as easy as possible for them. Uh, are Canonical or Ubuntu planning to get involved in any other sort of certification schemes? There are things, that are schemes like the Ingots or um, the ECDL, which could be twisted to, you know, use uh, free and open source software. Yeah, absolutely. We, we are in contact with ECDL. Um, too early to say where that will take us yet. Um, Ingots, we did speak to them a while back. We felt that, the ti that definitely their work is great, but not yet. Do you see a time when there's Ubuntu training available in pretty much every country around the world? That's exactly what we're aiming for, yes. I mean, we obviously, um, we, we, we've divided the world up into places that we'd like to get to versus places that we know there's already demand. We plan on establishing both training and 
are the things like support infrastructure in those places. And once that that goal is reached, then yeah, absolutely, the, the absolute aim of the game is to get Ubuntu all over the world. So therefore, training and um, other services have to be there as well. Absolutely. I think one reason uh, I could see for people wanting to get certification uh, is to help employability. Uh, currently, on a lot of job adverts, you see a Red Hat certified engineer as a as a requirement. Uh, do you think that's something we're going to start to see with the Ubuntu certification? Um, well, it's already if you if you look if you look on any job website and you key, and you key in Ubuntu, um, and we did this experiment this year versus last year, it, the, um, the the increase has been threefold. Um, so. Red Hat have done an amazing job, a sterling job, at getting their certification to a very high level. They've been top ten in the um, most, um, I, don't, I don't know, popular is the right word, or the most recognized, <laughs> uh, most recognized qualification um, in IT for a great number of years, and rightly so. And, um, yeah, I see no reason why Ubuntu um, won't reach their level if not surpass it. Excellent. Just like we have done, it, just like we have done in the actual operating system. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's absolutely no bias on this show. Yeah. <laughs> bias, bias. <laughs> yeah. Any and all information relating to Ubuntu training is on um, www.ubuntu.com forward slash training. Anything that isn't on there and you would really get, like to get an answer on, please, please, please send an email to training at ubuntu.com. Well, you're clearly very dedicated talking to us on a Sunday evening um, while we're whispering away on our podcast. So, yeah, thank you for that very much. I, I think we should also mention um, that she's phoning from Israel. So, yeah. uh, so I think, Ooh. you know, an international call to, to speak with us, I, I think we're very lucky. I think Mark can afford the expenses. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about image. Yeah. How important is image to us? Well, we've just had a lot of corporate headshots done. Yeah, and Dave didn't want his done because he hasn't had his hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> so it is important, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. I mean, um, if, so, I mean, I think to a business, I think it's probably maybe more important than to an individual. Yeah, I mean, you run your own business and presumably that business has got a profile and you want to maintain a good profile. You don't want to be associated with bad business or, you know, just potentially slightly dodgy business. What we're coming around to here is there's been some controversy recently about the enforcement of the Ubuntu trademark on uh, other projects and other companies. Now, Canonical, who hold the Ubuntu trademark, are, are generally pretty good about this. Um, but if you're using the word Ubuntu in uh, a, a project like this podcast, you have to email them and ask if it's okay, which is what we did. And they said, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Do uh, you? Well. Seriously, do you? I mean... Are we representing Ubuntu or are we representing the UK community or are we just a bunch of people sat around in a room talking about Ubuntu? All of the above. But if a company holds the trademark on a particular word, they have um, an obligation to protect that trademark. They can't allow it, allow it to be diluted. For example, there's a well-known manufacturer of vacuum cleaners, the original manufacturer in this country, Hoover, um, the word, word which is sort of now synonymous with vacuum cleaners. Um, and that's a dilution of their trademark, and they could run the risk of losing that trademark, and, th and anybody could make a product and call it a hoover because they haven't protected it. The same with people who make biros, the very common manufacturer of biros, and the people who make razors. And so if they don't protect their trademark in Ubuntu, somebody could you try to use it, have a court case, and they would say, actually, that word is a general public word that describes something associated with Ubuntu. And therefore, anybody can use it. And suddenly, anybody could make uh, distributions, call it Ubuntu, and it could crash everybody's servers and everybody thinks Ubuntu is rubbish. That's why trademark protection exists, as I understand it. The end. I, I, think, I think I actually agree with you there, Tony. I, I, I have heard before um, that if you don't protect it, you can lose it. So, yeah, I think that's a very valid point. Yeah. But the downside is that you have companies who want to do things with Ubuntu or in the Ubuntu uh, arena or community projects who then have to apply for permission, and sometimes they don't get it. Uh, I know when we were uh, forming Mythbuntu, the Myth TV distribution based on Ubuntu, uh, I know we didn't. We actually seeked permission to use the name from the community council, because I believe that was before there was actually a, a, a method to actually get trademark approval. So right. we actually did it through the Ubuntu community council. Okay. And they didn't have a problem with that. and uh, Because that was something which happened about that time, about the same time. 
it was actually said that there could be no more sort of derived distributions with the sort of Yubu or Ubuntu name in there. There was going to be a big crack on that because there were, there were, there were ones were appearing every other week or so. Mm. So that, I think that was the first step to this sort of crackdown, as I see it. Yeah, and so there are other distributions like Linux Mint that are derivative of Ubuntu but have had to call themselves something else. I don't know whether Mint wanted to call themselves something Ubuntu. But as I understand it, the actual Ubuntu and Ubuntu itself is trademark protected. So things like Zubuntu and Kubuntu and all that sort of stuff are covered by the, the same trademark because they use the word Ubuntu. But this has sort of caused quite a bit of uh, annoyance with some people. Somebody had started a, pro- a project um, that used part of the Ubuntu name in, 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 in its title. They kicked it all off and then after a few months of running this project decided they better ask for permission to use the a trademark or use Ubuntu, uh, were turned down and now have to sort of rechange all of their website and their mailing list, and they lose the sort of the brand identity they've built up. And they're quite upset about that, perhaps understandably. Well, from, from what I actually heard, they actually did apply at the same time they were actually starting the project. They actually applied to the trademark, the, the actual method to get trademark approval, and they only recently received a response. So... Mm. Okay, so more generally, do things like trademark stuff... Does this get in the way of, of people wanting to do stuff around Ubuntu? If you wanted to set up an Ubuntu, I don't know, a, a forum or something like that, or a group that was necess- wasn't necessarily part of the official canonical approved loco team structure, um, would you even think twice about having to go and get permission and that sort of stuff? I don't think I would have done, actually, until we, probably until we got into the podcast. Because it just, I don't know, it, it seems that by association you're sort of you're benefiting canonical by getting a, an extra bit of the community going unless i don't know let's say we have a, an ftp site um where anybody that uses ubuntu can go and take their files and um and let's not get into the issues with you know distributing files but just the theory behind it ubu ftp you know there you go ubu ftp why not What's the big deal? There are, you know, it's aimed at people that use the software. It's part of the community. What would be the big deal? But actually, I mean, since we started this conversation, I think I can actually now see the reason behind, you know, enforcing their trademark protection. I mean, I think one thing we also haven't actually really looked at, and I'm not sort of looking at this specific example, but more generally, now when something's actually carrying like a reference to the actual trademark name of Ubuntu, then the actual canonical that the trademark owners, they have to be respons- that they have to feel confident that they're going to represent the name correctly. For example, just say that our just say that our podcast wasn't code of conduct friendly, then they would potentially I would have thought have a problem with us using Ubuntu in the name of our podcast. There was a lot of bad press, was it about eighteen months ago or so, when a Ubuntu server was hacked? or hacked i mean it was uh, i can't remember exactly what the details were but there was a lot of bad press about that now this this community project is actually looking to offer free shared hosting um to to users now just say that that's i would just say that they uh, don't secure the server as well as a, uh, as well as canonical may and it does get hacked then that could bring bad press to canonical because it's got the ubuntu name on it or features the ubuntu name yeah, I mean, it's a very weak link, to be honest, but, I th- you know, it's certainly close. I suppose anybody who actually understands the, how the projects work and how the open source community works would be able to differentiate. But for a lot of people out there, in general, they may not understand the difference yeah, I mean, between a community project and a Exactly. Project. I mean, does, it, does it hurt? I mean, is this a big deal? Is this bad for the community when somebody, when a group of people set something up and Canonical say, uh, no, you can't use your current suggested name well it seems to cause some bad feeling it seems to really annoy some people they it's, they say it's almost as bullying you know as you can't use this we're going to make you do all sorts of stuff but it's surely down to lack of education and, and understanding and if you sit and have a conversation with these people and say look come on you must understand that this is a trademark for all the reasons we've just spoken about that we're protecting and no you can't and understand why you can't use the name, and move on. And then as more and more people understand how these things work, then surely you'll come up with 
something some outlandish name which people will remember for for the name itself and oh yeah that's where the ubuntu people hang out you don't have to use the name we could call this podcast anything we want but we still talk about ubuntu mm. i think we benefit from being known as the ubuntu uk podcast though sure it helps from a publicity point of view because people who are interested lots of people are interested in ubuntu and they therefore may be interested in this show whereas if we were called Falange podcast, they probably wouldn't download it. But surely it's down to the marketing, the marketing of your product. I mean, what's Ubuntu? Let's just take Linux off the end of it. What is Ubuntu? It's just a word. South African word. Sure. But we all know Ubuntu Linux because of the marketing that's gone behind the product and the brand name and all the rest of it. Now, I think this goes on to something else. Uh, now, I think because Ubuntu is so community driven, I think the actual members of the, of the community, some of them may feel they actually own a proportion of that trademark i mean we're representing the ubuntu now if suddenly they emailed us and said you can't use ubuntu in your podcast name anymore i think we would feel quite annoyed by that because i think we're doing good work here. well yeah initially maybe yeah it would be annoying because we've built up so much infrastructure around having ubuntu in our name you know the websites are part of the ubuntu uk and all this sort of stuff so it would be a lot of hassle to change it at this point but it's still their trademark. We're still having their permission to use it. And I guess that's kind of the deal, really. If they decided to revoke our permission to use it, we'd just have to live with it. This also is a balance of, is it good um, about Ubuntu being backed by a business? I mean, if you look at Debian, um, there's a lot of websites containing reference to Deb. Now, I mean, like Debian Administration, Deb a Day, you know, there's, there's a lot of these websites, mm. but they're not having a problem with the Debian trademark. So, but that's because Debian don't have a financial interest in in their initial whether, product. I don't know. Whether, I th- I'm not sure whether the term Debian is is trademarked or not. But uh, things like SUSE are. Yeah, but again, but they're business backed, though, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And I'm just wondering whether that affects the community around that distribution and things, and whether there's a similar kind of deal. If you want to set up, I love SUSE dot com, or I hate SUSE dot com, whether you should go through and, and apply for. Uh, trademark permission now there are some funny things particularly under the u.s sort of um constitution about freedom of speech that you can still set up sites that parody or um fair use they fair, fair use they? exactly so you could set up you know i hate ubuntu or i love ubuntu ubuntu sucks or whatever um under those sort of terms and conditions so it's not even the same everywhere over the world if you go to a country where the term ubuntu isn't trademarked there or you know and you're not talking about Linux, you're not talking about software. You can probably use the word Ubuntu however you like. There's Ubuntu Cola. But because they're in a totally different market, that's not a trademark infringement. It's like Apple and Apple. Yeah, Apple Records and Apple Computers. I mean, they have clashed, but only as Apple Computers get more into music. Well, in which case, maybe we should flip this on its head and say that the community should be supporting Canonical with the trademark. Uh, And think about it before you get cheesed off that your project is put on hold because you um you didn't get the approval before you actually went ahead maybe we should support canonical and say look okay we're not going to do this anymore we're not going to try and use the name i'm going to use my carlos fandango name and try and market it in some other way yeah the carlos fandango cast (laughs) there was actually something i asked mark about um I asked Mark shodworth in one of the these sessions where you do questions and answers and i said well hang on the um, the Ubuntu Foundation is a legal ad- legal identity in itself. Why hasn't the actual trademark been been passed over to them? And what did he say? I wouldn't like to quote exactly, but it was basically saying that Canonical have put a lot into it, and he thinks they deserve to hold on to it. Well, that's, that's fair enough. It's in Canonical's and the Ubuntu Foundation's interest to protect the community that they're building up. And I think it's in the community's interest to protect Ubuntu. I mean, yeah. whether it's backed by a business or not, it's got a huge reputation and a huge community built up around it. And if the name Ubuntu began to be abused or misused or become associate with, associated with shoddiness, and I'm not saying this particular situation is shoddy or anything, but you know, if it were to become uh, used by any project that felt like it, saying, oh, we're the Ubuntu hosting or something like that, then it could damage the reputation of Ubuntu and Linux in general and, and slow the, slow the uh, progression towards Linux domination on the desktop. So is there a way that Canonical could be seen to supporting such projects, shall we say? You can't use the name, but by all means, as part of the community, get your project going and 
you know, show us when it's ready and Canonical could support and, you know, market. But that's the opposite way around from what we were saying, which was apply for permission before you do all the setup and before you get it all set up and tested and integrated. Sure, but if we're now saying as they're as they're protecting it more and more, it looks like they might be saying no to more people. So from the outset, maybe the communities think, you know what, let's not even bother because it's it's almost too difficult now to get approval to use the name. How could Canonical encourage and market these projects um, that the community come up with? Could they? Should they? I don't know. It, it's, a, it's an interesting question because they're sort of saying these, are, these, these projects are allowed to use the Ubuntu name, although they're not official Ubuntu projects necessarily. We're at least saying that they don't misrepresent the Ubuntu uh, community and the Ubuntu ideals. Do they also consider the appropriateness of the name that you're trying to use? For what you're trying to do. In, in what way? Well, if you were to call a website, <laughs> I don't know, if you were to call a website where you could download Ubuntu from. Um, Ubuntu downloads or something. Well, yeah. I mean, or that's, something that's, not that's, as appropriate. Yeah. Where it, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain what it is. Here you go, Ubuntu dump. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's a site where you can dump all your files so you can share them with your friends. Yeah, okay. not a particularly good name, is it? No. And maybe they'd object to things on those kind of grounds, not just that you're using the word Ubuntu, but that it's not being used in an appropriate way for what you're trying to do. Now, mm. I mean, I, I can understand them doing um, things from now on, but what happens with things which are m more legacy things? I mean, one thing that comes to mind is there's a there's a community member that's got a website called UbuntuTutorials.com. Um, which is basically his blog where he talks uh, about how to do things. Um, I mean, it's no way affiliated with the rest of the community. It's just one person's blog. Mm. Um, so is it right that he actually has that in his website? Because he's saying it's a, like an authority on tutorials. So it, you know, could that, could Canonical say, actually, we want you to change that? Well, particularly if, and I'm not saying that this is the case with this particular guy, I don't know who it is, but if they were not very good tutorials and potentially damaging people's machines or things like that, you would expect an overarching company to sort of say, look, this is really bad. Don't put this out here using the Ubuntu name. Or just if he was um, diversifying off just Ubuntu onto other things as well. It's not strictly Ubuntu tutorials anymore. What about some of these other projects like the Ubuntu Christian edition or even the Ubuntu Satanic edition? Um, I don't know whether they've got you know particular permission to use them, but... Do you think they might start getting emails from Canonical? Yeah, so actually looking up things that have already happened and actually, mm. you mean Canonical actually chasing um, people who haven't actually applied for it? Because I suppose in many ways, th this latest one, if they hadn't have actually applied for the trademark permission, would they have a problem? Probably not. Okay, there are things uh, in the Constitution of the United States about freedom of speech and parody and blah, 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 blah. But... You can see why some people might come across the Ubuntu Christian edition or the Ubuntu Satanic edition and assume they're official parts of Ubuntu, even though at least the Satanic edition is in part a parody. And I guess in the past where Canonical might not have been too worried about it, as they get more and more visible, it's going to matter more and more to them. But are they likely to go back and chase legacy ones? Potentially. And actually, this is something um, which actually happened with another open source project i know that asterix had a similar thing whereas there wasn't a problem i mean people working on their website i use asterix they were having google ads with asterix in there and their name and then digim the actual people who own the trademark they uh, actually went to google and said can you stop any adverts with asterix in the name appearing on google ads mm. and and other things and you know they actually started chasing it and this caused a lot of resentment mm. In, in, in that community. Yeah. I think you mean asterisk, though, rather than the cartoon with the plucky ghouls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. well, I think one thing would be really interesting is if we actually got Canonical's uh, take on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's find out exactly what their policy is towards trademarks. How do they decide what does and doesn't get the go-ahead? We'll have to see if we can get somebody on from uh, Canonical. Canonical have joined the Linux Foundation. What does that mean? It means they're paying Linus Torvald's salary. Intel and Yahoo are bringing the web and TV together. So you can now trade shares 
check the weather and watch TV all at the same time. Yeah, just like Teletext has done for the last 30 years. <laughs> There's a new Debian-based games console called the Pandora. Wonder what's inside the box. Acer released their Aspire 1 sub notebook, which is $20 cheaper than the XP version. It runs Linpus. Twitter has failed. They've stopped sending SMSs for free. At all. And they're not charging for that. I'm surprised more people didn't Twitter about that. I'm here with Andy Stanford Clark, IBM Distinguished Engineer and Master Inventor, and he's going to tell us about his CC project. So, what is CC? So CC uh, stands for Say It, Sign It. It was an extreme blue project that IBM did last year with uh, some summer students. It's to take spoken language and convert it to a signing avatar on screen to help uh, deaf people uh, with a British Sign Language translation. So there's three stages to the process. The first is uh, a voice recognition system which takes a spoken language and converts it to a stream of text. That stream of text is then fed into uh, the CC engine, which does two things. First of all, it converts the word order of English to the word order of British Sign Language. So, for example, my name is Andy would be converted to name me Andy, which is the BSL version of that expression. And then the words that come out of that get fed into a BSL dictionary, which convert the individual words into gestures which are then fed to the final stage, which is an on-screen avatar, an animated figure, which can move its arms and hands and fingers around and facial expressions and so on in response to the instructions it's given by the signs in the dictionary to express in BSL the words that it was fed. So there's a dictionary of signs that you use with it? Yes, we had a a limited dictionary that we got from the RNID, the Royal National Institute for Deaf People, and that had about 3,000 words, and the corresponding SIGML, which is the sign markup language, which defines how the the avatar should move its hands and fingers and so on. Uh, But what we'd like to do, really, is build up that dictionary. So you could use it, in theory at least, to translate, say, the Ubuntu UK podcast into British Sign Language, either possibly directly or at at least from the written transcript. Yes, yeah, so well, the CC framework is pluggable, so we can plug different things in at different places. And one of the places you can feed a text stream into the CC engine. One of the reasons we thought for doing this was to be able to uh, render uh, subtitles from the TV as, as an avatar. So certainly if we had um, some kind of transcript from a podcast, then we could feed that in straight into the place where the output from the voice reco system goes uh, to create a, a signed version of the podcast. So you could have a really cool little set of avatars for the four presenters and they could all be sitting around in this fantastically high-tech studio just to show what it's really like behind the scenes. Yes, as long as the transcript was marked up with the individual speakers' names, then the the CC engine could then direct that output to different streams and different avatars could certainly render it. Yeah, that would be certainly possible. Okay, so the CC technology isn't open source in itself, but you say it's extensible. What kind of things do you see it being extended by? Just other dictionaries or could you add extra functionality? So we deliberately designed CC so that um, we could plug in, for example, different voice recognition engines, uh, voice reco systems for different languages. People could plug in different grammatical rules so as they worked out different translations between parts of English to parts of BSL, they could plug in those rules, uh, and also the dictionary itself. So one of the things we thought of was to have a community effort to build up the dictionary, so rather like a sort of Wikipedia thing where people can contribute content in the forms of words and the corresponding gestures that make up the sign for that. I think that would be really interesting because, first of all, we'd get regional variations for different words, which there are quite a lot of, uh, but also we'd get, as we've seen in the OSS community, loads of people contributing to, um, to a project would be really the only scalable way of producing a decent sized dictionary because you know, for one or two people to produce thousands of words is like a lifetime's work so the only way to really scale that out is to get loads of people enthusiastic working on it. And as you say you'd get all the regional variations of not only English words but the signs and American sign language, French sign language, whatever so in theory we could translate directly from the English podcast into French sign language if the right bits were plugged in? Yes, yeah, so you can plug in completely separate dictionaries
dictionaries. So if you had English words to French sign language, you could do that. Or you could have French words to French sign language and all the mappings in between. So one thing we thought of doing was, um, somebody suggested, it was Italian speech going through to American Sign Language. I don't know why they wanted to do that, but they said, could we possibly do that? And we said, yes, quite easily. And also because the SIGML, the sign sign markup language, is a standard, um, different avatar technology could potentially be used as the output. So, for example, you might be in an immersive world and walk up to a person, they might start signing to you with an avatar that's been driven from SIGML. So at the moment, there's no central point for people to contribute to this, I guess. Yeah, we we did talk to the RNID about this, um, and there is interest in building up... uh, a site to enable us to um, have people contribute to, diction- to the dictionary, but at the moment that that hasn't happened. Um, I think one thing that's hampering it is the tool that you use to generate the the gestures to sort of animate the avatar little one step at a time is rather clunky at the moment. It, that needs to be a lot more usable if we're going to get thousands of people contributing signs. But that's certainly something that I'd be interested in doing because uh, to have a, a very comprehensive dictionary would be a great contribution to, um, to the BSL language and to deaf users everywhere. So if anybody um, listening is interested in contributing or finding out more, can they contact you or is there somewhere they can go look for more information? So there's quite a lot of information about the CC project at uh, mqtt.org slash cc. That's big S little i, big S little i. Uh, and you can also email me through uh, via the website at mqtt at mqtt.org. And there's also a video on YouTube. Search on CC, S-I-S-I, and I think it comes up as the first hit. Yeah, that was a, quite a neat little clip that we did last summer of, uh, of a student using it, and it demonstrates the technology rather well. So, uh, yeah, I would encourage you to go and find that. OK, thank you, Andy. That sounds really cool. We've got a competition this episode to give away a VPS from Bitfolk, but it's probably worth talking a little bit beforehand about what a VPS actually is. Now, who here has got a VPS? I certainly have. How many have you got, Davey? At least one, if not two or three? About 20. Okay. (laughs) 20. Okay. Laura? (laughs) Not personally. (laughs) All right. Okay. So what do you use a VPS for? What is a VPS, first of all? Well, it actually stands for virtual private server. So, I mean, if you think about what a server is, normally a powerful computer, then it's a virtual server. So using virtualization to actually get um, what is considered and what you'd view to be a full computer, but you're not. You're only getting a share of it. Did you just make that really, really complex? I don't, did I? How about it's a login on a computer that I can't get to? There you go. Well, VPS. also, but you've also got root access, which you wouldn't normally have if it was necessarily... Because you've got your own miniature server. Yeah. Because in, in the sort of classic days of, of web hosting, sort of five years ago or longer than that, you, you bought a web hosting plan, but you didn't get the ability to install your own software and configure it, the server just how you liked. You could still have a server hosted in a data center somewhere, but you couldn't configure it just as you wanted. So a VPS is different from that because it gives you full root access, so you can do whatever you like with it. And if you destroy it, it's your fault. And it doesn't affect anybody else who's running on that server. Is that right? Uh... I think if, it can affect, can't it? If you if you're running your um, your server um, hard, it can affect the performance of the machine, can it not? Yeah, I mean, with some of the limitations of disk I/O, that's a really big one for um, for shared servers. If you're hammering the hard disks and things like that, reading and writing a lot, then that can have a detrimental effect to the other computers that's sharing on the actual main server. Um, now, there is actually a patch going into the kernel where you can actually limit people's I.O. Uh, per, per uh, task, uh, but it's certainly not stable yet. So you can take a physical server with, say, eight CPUs and eight gig of RAM and a load of disks in it, put it in a data center somewhere or in your house or in your bedroom, whatever, and divide it up into chunks. So you can give one gig of RAM to one person and some disk space and a CPU or a share of some CPUs, and they won't know whether they're running on your server or somebody else's server, it doesn't. the actual hardware underneath doesn't really matter to them. Is that right? Well, you actually, with most virtualization techniques, you can't actually tell what the real server is underneath. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the only thing you would see different is that you're using, for one of the most common um, VPS methods, you're using a modified kernel. So you'd, the only thing you would notice is that it's got normally hash zen at the end. But what difference does that actually make on a day-to-day basis? <laughs> um, well, no. thinking well, no no I mean the only thing I was thinking is um, you start to get a bit more well the, the only thing that with Zen you can't normally do unless you use the modified thing is to do um, 
you can't change the kernel at boot time. That's all done from the owner. That's the only thing I was okay. going to say. So for, for all day-to-day administration purposes, it's just like your own little server, but it presumably costs a lot less. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to actually co-locate your own physical server, um, you're looking at anywhere between 50 and a hundred pounds per server per month um i would say whereas you can sort of with some of the suppliers you can get them from about eight pounds per month so yeah you, you're making a fantastic saving there but why bother with a vps i mean <clears throat> we can host stuff at home obviously we all did it when we first started out um i've only recently in the last sort of six months gone over to a vps having had a small pc at home that i was um sort of using as a server as such um having Apache and, and things like that running on it and playing with FTP. You know, what's the difference between running that at home and getting a VPS? Is it is it worth the effort and the cost of getting a VPS when you can do it at home for nothing? I think it is actually easier to have it remote because you've got all the advantages of having the extra box without having to leave it on at home. You've not to... You're make... going to talk about power usage now, aren't you? I'm not going to talk about power usage. What, what I was going to say is that when Tony was prototyping the Hansler Wiki, we had that hosted in our spare room on a server there and um, whenever we had visitors come around we had to turn it off <laughs> which made us popular with the Hanslug cry because they wanted to sleep <laughs> <laughs> how dare they unnecessary um, or we also had problems with the broadband connection and like we went away for a week and if it went down at some point that was it cool. yeah no remote hands to do the reboot for you yeah and in some ways, you're actually only offsetting the, the environmental cost or the electric, electrical cost because the electricity is still being used. It's being remo- used in a remote data center. Well, I don't know, because actually that's another thing with virtualization using a, a VPS is the fact that there's only one physical server and you could have, you know, an excess of, of 20 people actually on that one machine. So, you know, that, that's fewer machines actually in use, though, isn't it? So if you've got one beefy server that's pulling, I don't know, a kilowatt as opposed to... 20 old machines each running at 200 watts you've halved your electricity costs so what do you use your vps for simon at the moment just experimenting um i've got a, a website which is hosted by a you know a proper hosting company in fact it's just about to run out and i knew that was coming i wanted to basically make the move up to my own server so i've got to do it all myself apache is configured by me mysql <laughs> It will eventually be configured by me when I've got my head around it uh, mm-hmm. and everything else. It's really, it's just a, another step up from uh, playing with it at home. Then I did it on a, you know, a proper hosting service and now I'm doing it all myself. So really it's all about experimenting and, and learning. I would say many people would probably say that when they first actually do what you're doing, um, it's actually a big sense of achievement because you've gone from the sort of walled garden of a shared server to where basically you might have a pretty web interface that will do a lot of things for you. Yeah. Um, set up your virtual host, things like that. And when you do it all yourself and it actually works, I, I think it's, you, you'll probably find a sense of achievement from that. Massive. The learning curve's fairly steep if you want to do it properly, of course. There are other benefits as well. Obviously, if it's not at home, um, I don't have to worry about the backups. I don't okay. have to worry about the power going out and it all going off because you know it, it's dealt with by the, uh, by, by the VPS company. Or maintaining the hardware if a disk goes. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, relatively cheap and it's definitely worthwhile. Do all VPS companies do backups for you? I mean, it's always worth checking. I, I never put my trust entirely in other people to back up my data for me. So one of the reasons I have a VPS is for my email. It's over in a VPS somewhere in London, and that has all my email on it. And I still are sync it back to home every day, so my data is in two physically separate places. If I needed to get hold of it, I, I could do locally as well as remotely. So you're on two servers, one at home and the VPS as well? We've got... Yeah, yeah. that's green for you. That's it. Well, it, it beats having uh, the server that was here as well as the, the local server. <laughs> We've only got one server now, no, that's right? Fine. As opposed yeah. to more than one server. <laughs> so it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and essentially all it is is a huge amount of disks that just backs up, um, backs up everything to it. So it's, it's not really a technical challenge for you. It's more of a... Um, a better utilization of the systems yeah it was a technical challenge at first you know i wanted to learn how to set stuff up but i had tried and played with my sort of home servers and stuff before so i could i kind of got the hang of apache and things like that um but setting up a remote mail server with accepting mail for the different domains i've got and uh, setting up spam assassin all that sort of thing and then setting up a web web mail interface to that that was all good uh, learning experience 
Um, and it's also useful to have a remote box to you can shell into if your home connection does go does go down. I can shell into my remote server and uh, still get access to my email and um, my IRC sessions if I need to. Actually, that was a big thing, wasn't it? Because our internet connection kept going down and we had no access to email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So IRC, you run an IRC um, server or no? Just a, just a client. So I run IRC inside screen which is the very popular combination um, which means that i can you know ssh into the server from pretty much anywhere and pick up my irc session and see what messages are going on or get help fixing a problem if i've totally broken my own internet connection at home <laughs> or something like so that. so your irc is on all the time you never really leave it i never quit it unless i've totally screwed up the configuration for my client and need to restart it sure or in some cases, if you get annoyed and you just think, I've had enough of IRC, I'm quitting. It's been a few years since I've had to <laughs> drop off IRC, Dave. <laughs> Unlike you. Unlike you. <laughs> no, no, no. Hang on. Uh, when was the last time I did that? You're going slightly About pink. About three weeks ago. I may have left the presenter's <laughs> channel, but I did not quit any networks. That makes it all so much better. Oh, thank you. Alan, God rest his soul, has left us a little list of... Um, things that he does with his VPS, which is probably worth looking at. Um, one of the interesting things is, is using it as a proxy, essentially to bypass um, location-specific services. So things like the BBC iPlayer are only accessible from within the UK. So when he's off uh, outside of the UK, he uses SSH tunnelling to connect through to the BBC sites and still get access to that content, which as a British TV licence holder, I suppose, is all right. Oh, one of the things about doing that is um, actually having a server in a data centre, you've got a very fast connection. So you won't necessarily see any extra lag tunneling that through your data center server. You won't see any extra real delay there. Whereas if you tunneled it from your home connection, then you're then relying upon your home connection upload speed. Mm. Well, so, you would download it on your home connection and then upload it yeah. at the same time, haven't you? So that sounds like a, a reasonable thing to do. And the other thing he says he does is run a, a BitTorrent server for mirroring Ubuntu ISOs. And the rest. And Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> But again, that's a good way of doing it. It's in a data centre, a lot of bandwidth. Um, presumably he has to watch his bandwidth limits uh, reasonably carefully to make sure he doesn't go over that. I should imagine just after a release, there's quite a lot of bit torrent bandwidth there. Yeah. One thing we've not covered is actually his asterisk. Now, I know that Dave is well into asterisk and uh, voice over IP. I've just about got asterisks working, certainly on, um, on receive, so you can call in. But I haven't um, touched that yet dialing out that's the next um, big thing to do but again another technical challenge and useful and in theory once it's fully configured i should be able to get rid of my landline which i believe you've done haven't you yeah yeah i haven't had a, a proper landline for about three years now so so what's the advantage of putting asterisk on a vps as well, opposed to a server somewhere well, in your house well one of the main things about doing that is uh, we all know that houses can have power cuts and internet connection drops and things like that now, I know you can have UPSs and such like that, but then, again, you've got a big server in your house. If you actually have it in a data centre, which is generally can be considered maybe more reliable than having one at your home, if someone tries to phone you and your home connection, for some reason, is down, then the voicemail is stored on the actual server, on the actual data centre server, your VPS. So if someone tries to phone you, there's no one through, it will then get through to your answering service. Could it do things like route it through to your mobile as well? Yeah, that, that's something else I did. But, again, you could do that from home. But then you're also relying upon... Because the thing is about home internet connections, and it's gradually changing. Generally, your upload speed is the limiting factor. Um, so if it's in a data centre, you don't have to worry about that because it's fast. And not everybody's got decent internet connections. Obviously, you're probably the lowest out of all of us, Tony, with a with the one meg. But, of course, there are still people that have got dial-up. <laughs> Simon, this is not a measuring contest. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah. 1.4 potential. Eh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you the great thing that I use it for. And that's given to um, commercial companies. You go and buy something or they want your phone number. I just give them my um, asterisk number and they never, ever ring my home. And it always goes straight to voicemail and into my um, email comes the message and it's great. I've never had any contact with any companies. But so we briefly talked about mail servers, but Tony, you said you were doing that. I think that's another really good use of a VPS because... Um, again, for the same purpose, that you can have it more likely to be up. So if your internet connection drops, you've got a more reliable mail service. Yeah, once you've configured it. I've had XM installed for, ooh, two, three months now. Well, it's easy to configure. What you do is uh, right, sudo okay. yeah. apt-get-remove <laughs> yeah. 
XSIM, yep. sudo <laughs> apt get install postfix. Nah. So this is the challenge, actually, is setting these things up. And, of course, I deliberately ensure it's um, from the command line. I don't want to deal with yeah. GUIs. There's generally, unless you're trying to do something really, uh, really idiosyncratic, though, there's generally some pretty good how-tos out there um, on Debian administration or the, those sort of sites, How to Forge, that will show you how to set up, whether it's Postfix or XIM and, and Spam Assassin and all that sort of stuff, which are the things that I've followed, both for home and work use. Yeah. They've got me there. Uh, so um, I suppose... Support is quite an important thing, actually. And I don't know whether it's... I'm in two minds about whether or not you should go to the hosts and ask for support or just go into, let's say, Exim as a specific example. If I want support, do I go to Exim, uh, an Exim RC channel or Exim website, sort of just dive into the VPS help? I suppose it depends on the VPS service. Well, I mean, I know a lot of VPS services, some of them offer managed, unmanaged, and, you know, maybe community support they have a community arm um but i think increasingly a lot of them are fully unmanaged now if i had a problem with an actual application on a server my first port would probably be google second one would be sure. to go into the isc channel of that project well and you've also got resources like the ubuntu uk community or your local lug or you know or the if there's a community of users around that vps hosting provider <laughs> Competition time. We had a question on the last episode, and the prize is uh, one of the canonical store vouchers. So, Davey, what was the question? The question was, who started the Samba project? The right answer was Andrew Tridgel, a.k.a. Tridge. So we drew a winner at random from the uh, 18 or so correct answers that we got, um, and the winner is Peter Felkowski. Congratulations to you, and we're going to email you the details of the voucher Really soon. Should we have a new competition? Yep, let's set another one. We've got a prize. This time it's from bitfolk.com, who are one of our mirrors. And the prize is £200 of Bitfolk credit. So basically you can have like a 300 meg VPS for a year or put that towards um, yeah, another configuration of your choice. Um, so th- £200 of credit at bitfolk.com. Um, what's the question? What Ubuntu distributions do Bitfolk offer as standard? I don't think we need to give a hint where the answer is for that, do we, chaps? No, I don't think we need to tell people to go to bitfolk.com and look that up. Right, so get your entries to us, please. Uh, competition at ubuntu-uk.org by the 3rd of September. So I think that's time, chaps. I think, I think we should wrap it up. Chaps and chapesses. Oh, and, yeah, and Laura's. Yes, chaps and Laura. Um, yeah, you can get hold of us, uh, as ever, on Twitter, twitter.com slash UUPC, and the wonderfully new and uh, free software-based Identica, identit.ca slash UUPC. You can send us emails. Actually, we'd love your suggestions for the show. Um, any recorded material, tips, reviews, rants, anything you like. Send it to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. And the phone number's on the website. And the IRC channel on the Freenode network, which is hash ubuntu-uk. So thank you all to all our mirrors for hosting us as well. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Goodbye.